Uh, I'm really excited to have uh, Joey Zwillinger today uh, chatting with us. He's the CEO and co-founder of Allbirds, and he has long been passionate about making things from renewable resources, which led him to start Allbirds and begin tackling sustainability issues in the footwear industry. Uh, and before Allbirds, I was at a biotech firm. But Joey, um, I think my favorite insider info tidbit on you is that you started your career as a consultant at Deloitte, where you worked for a garbage company and you were doing deals and landfills. Is, is that right? That is an inside inside bit of info. <laughs> yeah, I spent quite a number of months doing deals and landfills. It was a very good growing opportunity for me. And, and how did you know that it was, I mean, besides being in a landfill, that it was time to leave uh, being at Deloitte and start something else? <laughs> well, it's funny. You know, I, I think um, there's a couple of people who gave me some sage advice early in my career. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what I was looking for, look, first of all, my, my dad played a very pivotal role in making sure I knew that whatever I did, it had to have a bit of a socially uh, conscious bent to it. That I needed to impart something. If it was just going to do, if I was going to do business, it was fine. Uh, but it had to do something. And and for me, what clicked was was the environment. And so I left Deloitte and actually started working in, in uh, a small venture capital fund at the time. I was the first employee and we started investing in a whole bunch of different sectors, but I was mainly mm -hmm. in, in clean tech. And that kind of set me off on a, on a decades long journey. So that started you on the journey. At, how, how did you end up meeting Tim, your co-founder? Like, how did was he? How did you guys cross paths originally? Yeah. So, t t I mean, like any good thing in in life, uh, for me at least, it, is that it happened through my wife, and <laughs> she went to undergrad with Tim's wife. Actually, he was he was mm -hmm. uh, he was dating her at the time, and yeah. and um, he 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 started with a Kickstarter. He he's from New Zealand, so I think he was looking out his window and saw thirty million merino sheep or sheep in general, and and he said, "What the hell can we do with this?" He was a professional mm -hmm. athlete at the time, uh, and he ended up taking his like design inspiration and his desire to do something with with wool from New Zealand in his hometown, uh, and so uh, and so uh, my wife said, "You should give him a shout because he's he's uh, he, he's got some needs on the business side that maybe you could right. help with." And, and so I don't know a lot about like the Kiwi way of life, but wool shoes was a radical thing, right? It wasn't like they just have wool every category. Like that was still a new development, right? Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's <laughs> still, it's still new and it's, it's really, um, it's, it's hard. I mean, what, what the root of our company is mm -hmm. we, we, the inspiration. So I've been on this journey to, to show that you can make something that is a, a physical product that yeah. is no compromise on performance, no compromise on comfort, whatever the attribute is you're looking for, and, mm -hmm. and do that in an environmentally sensitive way. From the world that I was in before Allbirds, um, I knew that that to be true. It just take, took some willpower and some creativity and innovation. And and yeah. so, um, you know, this is coupling coupling with Tim, where he has the design insight and some really unbelievable intuitive consumer marketing in, in his mind and connecting those two to make materials born innovations that create products that feel different and feel unique. We, we started with wool. We've moved on to do a few other things since then. Um, yeah. but it, was, it was quite revolutionary because of how difficult it is to take such a fine, beautiful fiber and turn it into something that can withstand the challenges of footwear. Amazing. Um, and, and, you know, I want to just shout out to our audience tonight. Um, they are active in the chat. Um, I already have Manisha saying these shoes are so soft and comfy. So the, the material science is paying off there, Joey. And to the audience, if you have a question, this is an interactive session. Just head over to that chat and leave us your question. If you could start with a big all caps question, we'll take it here live and get Joey to answer it. And if we don't get to any questions today, no worries. Uh, we'll write them down. We'll see if Joey uh, will follow up with some answers for us. If we don't get to it just now. So uh, look, in your journey, uh, starting with um, now a, a new Kiwi friend who's building these wool shoes uh, on the sustainability path, it's taken off. Um, you know, we know that every founder's journey is has hundreds of times where it almost fails or almost falls apart. Um, but tell me about the first time that you realize it might actually work, that sort of this crazy concept for an idea might actually be the one that wins. Yeah, part of me is still waiting. Yes. Uh, I, I think like, 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 I think a lot of um, people who, who do well in the early stages of business mm -hmm. building, um, I have an absolute constant paranoia where, you know, in retail, people call it the retailer's nightmare. You just wake up every day and hope somebody shows up in your store. 
Uh, you know, look, we, I, I'm, people rip us off all the time. Uh, we, we have probably almost 20 knockoffs on the market. Um, it, it happened really fast, really early from like yeah. notable brands up to Amazon recently knocked us off. Um, so, you know, I haven't gotten there yet. I mean, we've yeah. been glimmers of like real positivity and, and real, um, really positive things. But I, I would say one thing that we did uh, that I would encourage all of you guys out there aspiring to build businesses or innovate within larger companies, whatever whatever it might yeah. be. You know, one of the things that we did early on was that we, we took a very small group, the first seven employees that we had, and we sat them in a room and we said, summer of 2016, put yourself forward 10 years in the wow. summer of 2026 and write down what happened over the last 10 years, why we were successful. And, wow. and we have... We have veered, uh, we've never really veered at all from that strategy. That's, that's the, the classic um, VC pre-mortem. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. It's a good way to put yeah. it. Amazon is, actually does this a lot in their culture, like the six page, right. most people have read about this stuff. We sure. found it to be incredibly inspirational. It, it, uh -huh. it allows you to hire better people because they're bought into the mission and what you're yeah. what, the strategy that you're doing. And, and it hits them, lets them hit the ground running faster when they, when they get in the door. Yeah, so I, I would say that you know to your to your question of, of of have we had success? We wrote a very ambitious journey from from day one, and and we're right. on that path right now. And I I couldn't be wow. more um, impressed with the team that's done it, and excited about the progress that we've had. Not not mm -hmm. to and like you know overcoming some struggles right. along the way. Uh, yeah, but but that we're we're just on the journey. I I, I don't mind being paranoid and, and just being. I, I love it. So we got we got to be paranoid. Uh, we haven't felt the success yet, but I imagine in 2015, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of VC action in in D to C brands now. Was it the same in 2015 when you guys were getting started? Were were people chasing after sort of different categories, looking for that breakout and product in the same way? It's funny that I, I would say that. Um, we we were uh, in an interesting window. I, I think mm. um, that window is largely closing um, or closed yeah. now. Um, and yeah, it, it was difficult at that time. I, I will say to your point, you know, we we put up a business plan and we yeah. gave it to investors when we did our seed round, and we beat our first year projection in two months or something like that. Right. So I mean, we we knew we were. That was a it was a rocket ship. It was good. We, we yeah. had a million dollar first month, and that was like wow. yeah. This is insane. So, yeah. uh, and for us, that's a lot of customers because our products are about a hundred bucks per, per right. Unit, so, per per unit. So, so th well, thinking back to that beginning, I've got a great question here um, from David. David, David's asking about patents and protecting IP. When you guys got started, was that a big thing for you? And and has it become more of a prominent thing over time to really think about the protection with all those knockoffs coming from left, right, and center? We've tried to be very pragmatic. I, I come from a company, um, my, my past one, we, we invested millions and millions of dollars in IP from a legal perspective. Yeah. Um, and so in, in the retail industry and, and, and brands like ours, there are quite a bit of areas for um, and opportunities for utility right. patents. But the way we try to think about it, first of all, we do all our design patents and copyrights and whatnot, but that's pretty soft, I would say, in terms of the relative spectrum of IP. Yeah. Um, on the hard it hasn't side. stopped hasn't stopped anybody yet. They keep, I mean, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't yeah. protect you all that much. It does, it does, it does really help, and you got to do it. And we we yeah. use it quite regularly to to defend ourselves against infringers. But um, but you know, look on the hard utility patent side, one of the things that we really tried to do is think about comprehensively from molecule all the way to finished product shoes shoes. Mm. Yes. Where, where do we want to win and where do we think we can add the most value? And that's where if we focus anywhere, we're focusing on on protecting IP. Now, for yes. an example, we've, we I would give is we actually um, we co-developed a brand new molecule called Green EVA. And we went okay. to Brazil and we co-developed this molecule out of sugar cane. Instead of making the midsoles from petroleum, the bottom unit of the sole, it's usually a sandwich between the top and the, the little rubber on the bottom. So yeah. it, we, we, we developed it out of a waste stream from sugar cane and yet we didn't put any patents. We didn't try to protect it. What we said was let's open source it to the world. And in doing that, we're going to make, we're going to turn an industry much more sustainable that helps our mission. And we're also going to pragmatically drive down cost of production. So we're going to get better pricing on that. Yeah. So I think being, being creative, 
about IP can take you in a whole bunch of different directions. Sometimes it's yeah. it's not obvious at all how you're going to win with your with your intellectual property. It's not always just saving it for yourself. Sometimes right. there's great places, particularly when it's not that value add. That's a high upstream molecule. We wow. do some fancy stuff to it downstream of that, and we just keep that as trade secret. That's that's um, that's unbelievable. And are you seeing the benefits of that sort of open source uh, approach to IP, for example, in this in this uh, sugarcane waste stream example? Are you seeing that pay off right now? A hundred percent. I mean, there, there's, yeah. there's probably we know of via our partner at least a hundred brands have have engaged and sampled twenty are launching products within within the next six months. I think. Um, wow. as far as we can tell, who knows what happens. Right. And, and, um, and, and the cost comes down. So, yeah. and, 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 and by the way, like if we get some good marketing out of this and, and people write stories about the fact that we've taken this approach because we've yeah. used a little creativity to solve this problem, like, of course that helps. So Joe, we've got a great question from Michaela. She's asking for new e-commerce brands who are considering retail or pop as the next step. What do you think about if it's a, still a smart move, I guess I'm curious if we start at, as you grew, you also invested in bricks and mortar, maybe it started as pop-ups. I know for sure you had the store on West Queen West. And of course, that's the pin that you've got going now. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit more about how you think about Omnichannel and, and if that's something that you would advise sort of e-commerce founders to be looking into, especially right now. Yeah, look, it, this all comes down to your strategy. And you're right. This is my pin from Queen Street West in Toronto, which is a fantastic three-month pop-up we did. This is my pride pin. Uh, these are both Peter the Sheep, uh, which is our one of our mascots, uh, informal mascots. So, look, I think I think um, if you're in retail, I think the the fundamentals of our strategy is that we have created, or we think of ourselves as inventors. We have invented something quite unique, and we have proprietary control of that merchandise. The only place you can come get is our website or our physical stores. So that's an exciting discovery moment for our customers. And if we keep innovating, which to that IP question, that's the most important form of protection is keep on innovating. And, and, and as we, as we uh, create great product and we have control of the channel, we need great places for them to experience it. And I will say that 10 times out of 10, the experience in our store for discovering yeah. products from our brand is going to be better than coming to our website when you have it, like it, it, that's that's funny because I think um, if you're a traditional retailer you would say wait you're saying the innovation is having a bricks and mortar store uh, you know we've been doing that for a long time so what exactly about that experience makes it more innovative than for example sending it to your house online I mean, look if, if you're looking for convenience going clicking a button and getting it shipped to your door in two days which is what we do and if you're in yeah. toronto it's usually a day we, we will we, it's it's awesome like if that's the experience you're looking for what i'm talking about is if you want to learn about the product that you are buying and you want to learn about what yeah. goes into it we spend incredible amounts of energy resources and time to to educate our brand ambassadors to deliver an unbelievable yeah. experience and we get it right every time. You, our, our NPS is, is usually in the 90s in our retail stores. So I mean, like unbelievable yeah. experience. Wow. And, wow. And, and how does that, for those people who don't know the benchmarks, how does that compare with sort of upper other decile, NPS? Upper retail. deciles typically 70. Yeah. 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 And so we're, we're probably Amazing. upper 1%. And that, that's, that's I just say like yeah. that we made an investment in that. And so look, it, it's not for every business. I'll, I'll say that. Yeah. If you're a retail of other people's goods, I would say you should steer yeah. clear of brick and mortar because that you are selling commodities and the the value of curation to customers is no longer what it once was. But if you have proprietary yeah. merchandise and they want to experience, we have tactile uh, is is the tactile nature of our products really important. So we have to think that through and we design end to end. We created a box right. to fit uniquely in our retail, our packaging, things like that. So this is like a design led thinking process with the customer at the center. And if your business strategy yeah. supports this and it creates an exciting moment for your customer. I'm, I'm a huge believer that brick and mortar is going to continue to be special yeah. if you have great retail. If you have crappy retail where you're selling commodities, like forget that. It, nothing's going to nothing's gonna save you. But, but I don't think online is going to save you either necessarily. No, I agree. There's bigger companies yeah. out there yeah. that are doing that. So that's interesting. So when you raise then your money and you're thinking about where to put it on, in sort of technology, in product, in marketing, um, it sounds like you're saying the focus has got to be in product versus on either of those. How, how did that play out for you guys sort of as you scale? Yeah, it's, 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 that's an interesting question because I, I, I would say that it, it ebbs and flows. Like we we have always had an unbelievably high investment in product. 
Um, right, so right. that that's that that is super super important. I will say that our technology investment is now quite um, quite significant, and it's like first of all, we have you know you guys will be happy to know that we we support one of the larger Canadian publicly listed companies. Uh, which is Shopify. So we've been a Shopify customer for four years, I guess, however long we've been around, wow. four, a little, little over four years. And w- so we don't spend a lot of engineering resources on reinventing the wheel. Uh, and I think w- yeah. with problems that are solved, we've, we've, we've always steered clear. So early on, our tech investment, when yeah. we weren't thinking about sophisticated problems, was, was very low. Now we're really engaging right. in this in, in a in such a rich data environment, and we're using that to create better customer experiences. So now our tech investment mm-hmm. is significantly ramped up. We we actually we, we we acquired a group of of engineers last year, and we we've done a whole bunch of things to really augment our uh, our capabilities there. And then marketing, I mean, marketing is always something that's critical because um, you're in yeah. when you're in consumer, the space of consumer. There's almost no company where you can just develop yeah. the best tech and it solves everything. Like that's very well. One, one thing I've always admired about you guys, it's it seems like um, earned media comes very easily to you. I, I remember um, there was like a front page uh, business story on the New York Times, which was just like a, it seemed like a played product placement. Um, how, how do you guys do uh, sort of PR and earn media so well? What's the what's well, the secret? I, I think. Um, I'm glad you think it, it looks easy. Uh, it, it, we 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 uh, we do feel like earned is the right term for it because we we think it's the yeah. it, we think it's the result of a lot of authentic hard work and and honestly yeah. like consumers are smart as hell and they may not be able to articulate why something has broken through and gotten their attention um, but they are smart and they sense it intuitively and the media yeah. is a great uh, microphone for the same exact sentiment. And and if you put right. in, we we ship our shoes to or, or other products to to our reporters that cover us always before we have a first conversation with them because we want them right. to experience what we've done before they start to just ask us business strategy or, or random other questions. It's about it's about the work that we put into it. I I love that, and the work that you put into it, I think, also extends back to you mentioned sustainability. You know, developing a new midsole out of sugarcane waste uh, stream, which is incredible. Um, that's an amazing sort of investment that you guys put in now, but how did that all begin? Like you can't, uh, I, I don't think you started by, um, pioneering necessarily a whole new, uh, material, but maybe you did. And how do you think about the sequencing of if you're sustainable minded, where do you start versus the impact that you can make now that you're bigger? We, I mean, uh, to be candid, we really did start that way. And, and our, our view was, uh, like, I remember when we did our seed round financing, everyone Everyone we'd go to very commonly would ask, "What if, what's your like 1% to the planet strategy? Like, are you doing a buy one, give one? But we're like, no, no, you're missing the point here. Every product that we make has sustainability woven into its DNA, huh. quite literally. And we, 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 yeah. we went from ground up from day one. And the sugar took us three years, the sugar, the sugar foam. Wow. We call it sweet foam. Uh, it took us three years to accomplish that. And we knew that that was a big weakness in our shoe from the beginning, from a sustainability perspective in particular. But we had castor bean oil, vegetable oil based insoles. And we had, you know, merino wool upper and a whole mm-hmm. bunch of other things, recycled, recycled uh, synthetics when we had to use them. Right. So, so we, we built that in. I would just, I would say, if you want to be sustainability minded, there's two different approaches. One is do your uh-huh. business and then append on CSR and do the right, do right within the constraints that you think are reasonable. The other approach is make a product that is sustainable because we, we have a mantra internally. And what we, what, what we say is uh, people don't love sustainable products. They love great products, but truly great products are sustainable. And we live by that mantra and we, we live by that. And what, what we mean is, the, we believe that people want no compromise performance with sustainability as the enabler of that performance. And that's how we look at it. And so right. we've woven it in from day one. And, and that's why I think we're different and why we have an opportunity to, to really be something special in, in, in an industry that's enormous and pretty competitive. Wow. wow. Fantastic. I think that's a, that's a super interesting takeaway, which is um, your sustainability angle can't take away from any product efficiencies. It can only enhance a strong yeah, product, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Uh, so, so look, I think there's a lot of founders out there um, who are building, whether it's D2C or in the e-commerce space, 
Um, and for a lot of categories right now is a really exciting time. A lot of um, offline spend is shifted online for convenience, like you mentioned. You know, what are some gotchas that that you experienced while rapidly scaling that that you think people should be looking out for mm-hmm. right now? Yeah, it's a it's a really great question. I mean, look, with with it's hard to talk about <clears throat> uh, people being really successful in a time when like a lot of people are not are, are having a really hard time. Uh, but I don't want to yeah. diminish the severity of what's going on, um, both COVID, uh, racial injustice, and everything else that's swirling about us. I mean, it's 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 like saddening and dark times. Well, but the point that you make is true. Like that, whenever there's big shocks to the system. Some, there's winners and losers, and and if you're sitting, you know, in the grocery delivery at the moment, you're you're high fiving, and and so, you know, I guess it, it's difficult to to predict what the future is given how much how many variables there are here. But some things that we're thinking about, um, you know, look, we we think that there's going to be, as I said, fundamental belief in the idea that discovery in a brick and mortar retail environment is going to come back and people are going to love it. People are going to probably because they tried Instacart, they thought it was convenient. The, some of those people are going to keep yeah. doing that. Um, so I think what I would just encourage is um, if you are one of those businesses that's enjoying some tailwinds, given what the current situation is, first of all, go get money. If you need money in the future, <laughs> go get it because people will give yeah. you the money because they're looking to deploy cash. So this is a great opportunity yeah. to, to like capitalize your momentum into actual capital. Second is be very conservative with building your overhead and do not underwrite your future business size to reflect some of the metrics that you are, are enjoying today because things are going to change. And I think as you stay, stay, stay lean and stay I nimble. Think absolutely. And right. Like, like bank the yeah. money, bank the money if you can get it. And then, and then, yeah. and then pretend like you don't have it. And, and that's, I think that's, yeah. that, that is what I would do in, in anyone's yeah. situation right now. If you're in retail, yeah. it's pretty unlikely that you're in that situation. And so I think on the flip side of your question, if you're finding yourself with some headwinds, there's been some slowdowns, yeah. I think you need to act with, with swiftness and decisiveness and a whole bunch of compassion, compassion. And, you know, we're a, we're a B Corp and we believe in, in a stakeholder model of, of, the, of, of interacting in the private sector. So take care of your employees, take care of the environment, take care of your customers. But, you know, you also need to take care of your business and you need to be a durable, resilient business that weathers this storm and do what you need to do uh, and just do that with compassion. Do it with compassion. I love that. It's a motto here at TechTO as well as we help each other win together. Joey, this was so cool. Thank you so much. We only got to like three of, I'm going to say 30 questions. So we're going to write those down. Would you be okay if we answer some of those offline for the community and something back? Send them over. You put me in the box. Awesome. Of course. No, you were great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joey, for your time. Thanks for sharing with the community.